Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and I couldn't be more delighted to see all of you here with us this afternoon. Um, today's event would not have been possible without generous support from the National Poverty Center and its interim chair, Sandy Danziger. Um, I also want to thank the School of Social Work for co-sponsoring today's event. I know that many students from Social Work are here with us. Very welcome. We're delighted that you're here with us, too. Um, we're pleased to be joined by some senior members of the University Administration, Tim Lynch, who is the University's General Counsel, and Lisa Rutgers, who's Vice President for Global Communications. We're delighted that both of you are here with us as well. Um, well, thank you for, for, for coming here to join us um, to learn from the School of Social Work and the Ford School's own Professor Luke Schaefer and co-author Kathy Eden. They presented their work, which you are about to hear about, in Washington, D.C., um, to multiple audiences of policymakers, and I know that they are going to explore some of the really important policy issues and implications of the research that they have been doing with us here today. Luke and Kathy's book, $2 a day, living on almost nothing in America, has been featured in The Atlantic, The New York Times, Huffington Post, Chicago Tribune, and I could go on and on. It has received considerable, very well-deserved attention. So all of the press and policymaker attention is really noteworthy, but um, most importantly, it really amplifies a crucial finding in Luke and Kathy's book, and that is that there are 1.5 million American households living in poverty and extreme poverty, and that that number is increasing. Um, that, that's really a, a striking number and something that should really uh, garner a lot of our attention. During years of on-the-ground research throughout the country, Luke and Kathy have documented families who are struggling under these extreme conditions, connecting to a very real face to that shocking data. Luke and Kathy will delve further into their research methods and findings during their talk, but first I wanted to tell you a little bit more about them. Uh, Luke's research focuses on the effectiveness of the U.S. social safety net in serving low-wage workers and economically disadvantaged families. Luke has pursued policy advocacy at both the state and the national levels. Uh, and prior to coming to Ann Arbor, he participated in Chicago's Anti-Poverty Policy Initiative, successfully helping to raise the Illinois minimum wage and expand access to health care uh, access to health care to low-income families. With Kathy, he recently presented their poverty research to the President's Council of Economic Advisors. He is an associate professor at the School of Social Work, and he very recently joined the Ford School faculty this year. We're delighted to have him on board. Kathy Eden is Bloomberg Distinguished Professor at Johns Hopkins University, where she specializes in study of people living on welfare. Over the years, Kathy's books have tackled very tough and important social challenges, including Making Ends Meet, How Single Mothers Survive on Welfare, and low-wage work with current dean of the School of Social Work, Laura Lane, and doing the best I can fathering in the inner city with Timothy Nelson. The Department of um, Housing and Urban Development, um, the National Institutes of Health, and the National Science Foundation, among others, have, found it, have funded her poverty research. She's a trustee of the Russell Sage Foundation, and she serves on the Department of Health and Human Services Advisory Committee for Poverty Research for poverty research centers at several universities, uh, including here at Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, when she became a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Political and Social Sciences as well. So, Kathy, thank you so much for traveling and joining us here today uh, to share your work with Luke with our community. Just a quick note about today's format. Luke and Kathy will make their presentation and then welcome questions from the audience. Beginning at about 4.40 p.m., um, members of the Ford School staff will walk up and down the aisles to collect your questions. You should have received a card when you came in. Please write your questions on that card. If you are watching us online, please tweet your questions into us using the hashtag policy talks. So after the program, 
$2 a day will be available for purchase and signing in the Great Hall, and I hope you will stay with us to continue the conversation and also to uh, have your book signed by Luke and Kathy. And so, with no further ado, I'm delighted to welcome Luke and Kathy to the floor. Thanks, Dean Collins, for such a warm uh, and personal introduction. Uh, I'm going to start with the story, uh, because the story is how we got here. Uh, sometimes graduate students want to know how you come up with ideas for research. Um, my uh, fail-proof recipe is to spend a lot of time uh, with folks out in the field. And this was very much a story of, of how uh, just immersing uh, your, your, yourself in your daily life with the lives of poor people allows you to see something new. So um, as, as Dean Collins mentioned, uh, at the beginning of my career, I spent six years running around the country uh, interviewing low-income single mothers about their budgets uh, with the Dean of School of Social Work, Laura Lane. And uh, because of that uh, experience, I kind of have a mental calculator in my head. If we go out to dinner tonight, I might look at you and suddenly say, so how, how do you make ends meet? Uh, that kind of became a habit over those early years. Uh, I had gone on after welfare reform, uh, that book was published in 1997, uh, to study the family and to study the working poor. Uh, but in 2010, uh, I came to Baltimore to study the lives of a group of people my colleagues and I had been following uh, since the mid-1990s. These were uh, young people who had been zero to seven uh, in the mid-90s, all born in public housing, and we had been following their lives over the years to see uh, how, how they would turn out. And so in 2010, uh, as they were reaching adulthood, uh, I came to Baltimore. And uh, I, uh, you know, I started hanging out in the neighborhoods. And of course, several of, many of these uh, young people were in fairly disadvantaged circumstances. But uh, uh, one day I went and, and visited in the home of Ashley. Ashley lived in the Latrobe homes with her mother, her brother, uh, an elderly uncle and uh, uh, sometimes a cousin. And uh, she had just had a baby. The baby was two weeks old. Uh, when we arrived at the house, um, uh, Ashley was visibly, visibly unkempt. Uh, she looked depressed. Uh, she was uh, you know, holding her baby over her, her, her shoulder, uh, but she was a hard, having a hard time adequately uh, supporting her baby's head. Uh, of course, uh, there was only there's hardly any furniture in the house, and so uh, Ashley sat on the the only chair in the kitchen, and and uh, I sat on the floor, and this gave me the perfect purview into the kitchen. This is an old trick I learned from Dean Lane. You know, she was always looking in the kitchen cabinets uh, to see what was in there, and and I quickly noticed there was no food in the house, uh, nor was there any baby formula. When I began uh, asking Ashley, of course, how she made ends meet, what I quickly learned is that there was no cash coming to the household. Nobody had a job. Nobody was getting anything from TANF. In fact, nobody in the family was even getting food stamps. Uh, but they did have this housing subsidy. So I started wondering, you know, is, is this a thing? Are there a group of people who might claim something uh, from uh, the in-kind safety net but have no cash? So I kind of tucked that thought in the back, uh, in my back pocket. And, and the next day, uh, we kind of invented a ruse to revisit Ashley because we were concerned about her and the child. Uh, we said, you know, Ashley, we need to ask you a few more questions. Can we come back tomorrow? And she said, yes. Uh, so we gave her the $50 upon leaving that we give respondents at the end of an interview. And the next day when we returned, um, we met her at the door. She was on her way out. She'd forgotten we were coming. Uh, she had uh, gotten a home perm. She looked terrific. Uh, she no longer looked depressed. She had kind of a spring in her step. Uh, she had um, gone down to the local Goodwill, which is just down Broadway Avenue uh, from the Latrobe Homes, and bought a new pantsuit. And in fact, she was on her way uh, to search for work. Uh, it was as if her, her confidence had been restored. You know, $50 isn't that much money. Uh, but for Ashley, it seemed to be the difference between really uh, being despondent and sort of unable to function uh, and, uh, and, and to get that kind of confidence and courage to go out and, get a, 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 and search for work. So 
Uh, this prompted a second thought, which would, uh, and these two thoughts, by the way, ended up being the arc of the book. What was it about cash that was so special? She had a housing subsidy, but something about cash, just a little bit of cash, seemed to be transformative. And if it was true that there were a whole group of people living with virtually no cash in America, you know, since the advent of welfare reform, and we did, you know, we, we did learn that this story was linked to welfare reform, uh, that we're living on virtually cash in America's most advanced industrial country, or in the world's most advanced industri industrial country. What did that look like? And what were the implications for the well-being of families and children? So it just so happened, and this was pure serendipity, uh, that I had visited the School of Social Work and given a talk the year before, and Luke and I had cooked up a plan for him to come to Harvard as a visiting professor. Uh, so that fall, uh, I think it was at 8 o'clock one morning in Cambridge, I was teaching at Harvard at the time, Luke came to my office. I told him the story of Ashley. I said, I want to know if this is a thing. I, I knew enough about Luke to know that he was one of the nation's experts on an obscure data set called the Survey of Income and Program Participation, which was in fact uh, the, the best data set to really answer the question of whether uh, there had been a rise in a form of uh, destitution in America that was so deep we didn't even think it existed and had actually never even looked to see if it was there. Uh, and uh, Luke can take the story from here. Well, I think at that uh, first 8, 8 a.m. meeting, uh, it's unclear if Kathy actually remembered I was coming. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but we, we had a terrific time, and she said, gee, I just wish you know, I was uh, visiting all of these homes, and I wish there was some data set where we could see, was there some sort of trend over the past 15 or 20 years of, of more families surviving on virtually no cash income? Now, the SIP uh, is a, it's a large-scale, nationally representative data set conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau. They go out and they, they interview tens of thousands of households, and they, they ask lots of very specific questions about different income sources. So it does the best of any source that we have at capturing the income of the poor. Uh, and all of these surveys have the challenge of sort of missing some income, underreporting of income. People might not want to tell you about sources, but we know that the SIP is the absolute best choice. And, and so we thought it was the right place to start. And so Kathy likes to say that uh, within a day I was back, I think it was about a week, uh, uh, where uh, and we started to sort of search around for some benchmark of virtually no cash income. How do you operationalize that? And as all of my students know, uh, as I would say, if you have to find an arbitrary line, uh, use somebody else's. So we used the World Bank's metric of $2 per person per day, and we wanted to see could we see a trend among households with children? We're going to include all the cash coming in through odd jobs, through, through work. We're going to include gifts from families and friends, all of it that's reported. And we're going to see if there's a trend over the last 15 years or so uh, in more families experiencing this. And, and then we're going to include SNAP, food stamps now called SNAP. Uh, and we're going to say, what if you treated food stamps as a, a dollar of SNAP as a dollar of cash? And we're going to tell you why we actually think you can't do that for this specific population as we go on. But we'd at least get a sense for what kind of impact the safety net as we have it today uh, uh, was having. So in about a week, we had this trend line to deal with. And I think it was maybe a little more dramatic. than we were initially expecting. So this brown trend line uh, is households with children who are uh, reporting cash incomes of no more than $2 per person per day in any given month. And you can see it goes from about 636,000 as of uh, mid through 1996, that's just before uh, the 1996 welfare reform was implemented, to about 1.5 million households with 3 million children uh, as of 2011. So that's more than a doubling, perhaps a, even a larger increase than we were necessarily expecting. If you add in food stamps and you count a dollar of food stamps as a dollar of cash, that's the blue line. And you can see right there the incredible impact that this program is having uh, at the very bottom of the very bottom. It's, it's virtually the only safety net that we have uh, left. Uh, uh, and, but even so, you can see, uh, we're, uh, even if you count food stamps, that blue line only looks good um, relative to the top line. We're still talking about an 80% increase, uh, even when you count SNAP uh, as cash over this period of time. 
So we actually released this. Sheldon Danziger here at the Ford School um, told us uh, to go ahead and release something. So it was a five-page policy brief, probably the shortest thing either of us had uh, ever written. Uh, and it ended up getting uh, some attention, uh, but it really raised a lot more questions and we had answers, right? What does it look like to live on $2 per person per day? Is this really just maybe noise in the data? You know, are, are people, is it just underreporting of income or something screwy going on with imputation? So we started to do two things. The first was we wanted to look for other sources of large scale data that might say, you know, is this a trend that we can see? Uh, in the population as a whole? Can we externally validate what we see in the SIP uh, with these other sources of data? And the second thing uh, was to start to try to find families, thinking that the proof was really you know, right there. Could we, could we find families that live like that? And if we could, what did their lives look like? You know, how did they get into these circumstances? And what did they do to survive? So starting just with the uh, large-scale data, one thing is that the SIP is a longitudinal survey, so we could look over time, and we wanted to know were these spells of families living on $2 per person per day, were they short spells, a family sort of experiencing a month or two months at a time, or was it really a story about longer spells? And what we could see when we look longitudinally is actually the biggest increase was among these longer spells, what we call chronic spells, families who are living for at least seven and as much as 12 months under this uh, low threshold over the course of a year. And it's more than a tripling, right? So it outpaces the growth uh, in the, 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 the monthly estimates. We knew SNAP was a big part of the picture, right? It's this buffer that we have. Uh, and we, uh, we, we looked in the SNAP administrative records. So if you go down to the technical appendix of the, the annual reports that they release, you can actually tally the number of households with children uh, who are reporting that they have no other cash income except uh, SNAP, right? So no actual cash coming into the house. So we plotted that, that's the dash line against the boxes from our most recent estimates. And you can see we line up really well in 1996 and 2005 and across this whole spectrum. And actually when I saw these first two lines, I took the rest of the day off because you virtually never see two sources of you know, entirely um, different data line up that closely. And then uh, the SNAP data actually starts to outpace us. So you see that it's going up to an even a greater extent than our, our comparable $2 a day estimate. As we started to get into the qualitative work, we saw that housing instability was a major piece of this. And so we knew that the nation's public schools in about the mid 2000s started recording uh, the number of homeless children. These are children without a permanent place to live. Uh, across the schools, we would assume that this is an undercount. Uh, so here I've sort of plotted the same, uh, the, uh, this trend line for you, and some of you can probably figure out in 2005, 2006, what accounts for that spike. It's uh, Hurricane Katrina and uh, um, uh, everything that went on there. But you can see a very similar sort of trajectory, right, of increasing numbers of uh, children at sort of a similar pace um, in extreme poverty. I'm sorry. Uh, without a permanent place to live. And then if you go to Feeding America, they have, uh, uh, they have reports that they list every few years that captures a number of unduplicated Americans who have benefited from private emergency food programs. Now, again, this is not a directly comparable number, but we thought if what we were seeing in extreme $2 a day poverty was actually something that was happening on the ground, we would probably see an increase uh, here too in the number of uh, families seeking emergency food assistance. And you can see as of 2009, it goes up dramatically, right? And that's the effect of the Great Recession. But again, that sort of dwarfs actually a, a fairly sizable increase as of 2005. Between 1997 and 2005, this goes up by about 4 million American, more Americans seeking uh, emergency food assistance. So across a series of indicators, Right, using both nationally representative survey data and administrative records and reports from our charitable organizations, we can see a consistent story of deteriorating circumstances among the poorest of the poor families in the United States. So what did this mean? We decided uh, in order to, to continue our collaboration, we needed to actually go back uh, to households like Ashley's 
Um, and uh, in order to, to understand four pivotal questions, who falls into uh, extreme poverty, uh, what's it like, uh, you know, what's the texture of daily life like, how do you survive, and what are really the implications for families and children of a, of a level of poverty this deep. Uh, so um, we were inspired, uh, I think both as young people, by the work of Michael Harrington. And as you know, he kind of went on the road and, and exposed poverty in various places across uh, the United States. Uh, our site selection was actually driven by the SIP. Uh, so we, uh, show, we chose sort of what we feel is the quintessential American city. I apologize to Detroit and Ann Arbor. Uh, but uh, we felt that was Chicago, and so we began our exploration there, kind of a, a typical American city, if there is such a thing as a typical American city. We also wanted to find a town that had been really a boom town in Harrington's time, but it had uh, since hit the skids. And uh, we landed in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, where I uh, lived for three summers and kind of fell in love with the city. I actually have a t-shirt that says, Cleveland is my Paris that I, I wear proudly, <laughs> and a bumper sticker. Um, but we also saw in the SIP that there was this clustering, this slight clustering of the $2 a day poor in the region the Census Bureau calls the Southeast. Uh, this is, of course, Appalachia and the Deep South. So uh, we chose a site in Appalachia, the Johnson C City, Tennessee area of Eastern Tennessee. Uh, and what was interesting about this site is it had been deeply poor in Harrington's time. Uh, but had since seen a bit of a rebound, but still had deep pockets of poverty. And finally, we went to what one writer has called the poorest place on earth, the Mississippi Delta. Is Bethany Patton here? Can you stand up? <laughs> Bethany Patton brought us the Mississippi Delta. So thank you, Bethany. Uh, through her experiences at TFA, she was able to make amazing connections for us so that we can do uh, in-depth work in the poorest place on earth. Uh, as you can imagine, this was quite an adventure. Um, but I want to take a step back for a second and, and talk about the fact that we make the claim uh, that what we see in the growth of $2 a day poverty is intimately connected to welfare reform. Now, at its peak in 1994, AFDC, the Aid to Families with Dependent Children Program, uh, the precursor of TANF, right? Uh, served about 14 million people, about uh, 10 million adults, 5 million children. <coughs> okay? But currently, that number is dramatically lower. So today, we only have about 4 million people on the rolls, under 3 million children, just about 1 million adults by latest count. Okay? So uh, the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities uh, constructs a measure of uh, the TANF to poverty ratio to get a sense of how many eligibles are actually able to access TANF. And of course, TANF is uh, the Temporary Assistance to Needy Families Program. It's the program that replaced welfare when welfare was reformed. So that number was at about 68% in 1996. And uh, uh, I just heard an update from uh, Donna Pavetti that the current number is 23% today. Okay. Now, when I say there are a million adults left on the rolls, what's really crucial to understand over and above that is that half of those are adults are in only two states. These are, the, these are the states with the most vibrant welfare systems, although those systems have also atrophied dramatically. And these are the states of New York and California. So once we take out those adults, we only have a half a million adults on the welfare rolls across uh, the, the rest of the country. So, if you didn't need that as evidence that TANF is essentially in receivership in the United States, or to use the, the title of our chapter, uh, Welfare is Dead, uh, you need to come with us to Chicago, where we met Madonna Harris. Uh, Madonna was living with her daughter, Brianna, uh, kind of moving across a group of homeless shelters in truly desperate straits. Uh, one weekend, uh, while I was hanging out with Madonna and, and Brianna, uh, there's absolutely no, no food in the house. The shelter wasn't serving any kind of meals. All they had was a half of, uh, a gallon of spoiled milk in the refrigerator, the inspiration for the cover of the book. And I said uh, to Madonna, why don't you just go to TANF? Uh, she said, oh, haven't you heard? Uh, they aren't giving that out anymore. And we heard this again and again and again. The notion 
uh, that welfare was dead. Okay. Uh, so we then went to Johnson City, Tennessee, where we met a young couple, Jessica and Travis Compton. And if you've read uh, the excerpt in the Atlantic, uh, Jessica is, is the plasma uh, donator that we feature. And this young couple was truly desperate. Uh, they had gone months without work. In fact, as we talked, each time we visited, Travis was sitting at the window looking for the sheriff to come and evict the family from the home because they were so far behind on the rent. Uh, when I said, or maybe I think, Luke, it was you who said uh, to Travis, what about welfare? What about TANF? And uh, Travis looked stunned and said, what's that? Now, some of our respondents had heard of TANF or welfare. Uh, one such person was Ray McCormick, who steadfastly had resisted uh, going to the welfare office because she felt uh, that she was a worker and she didn't think that uh, this was something workers did unless they were truly desperate. But that point came, and Ray did finally go down to the Tannis office. And when she came back, her report is that she had been rejected and told, uh, honey, there are so many poor people, we just don't have enough to go around. You need to come back next year. And there are more and more examples of states and locales, even local, uh, local uh, welfare offices that are engaged in, the, in these so-called soft diversions. Uh, to keep people from the, ro from the roles. And in Q&A, we can talk about why uh, TANF offices might be motivated to do that. Wow. <laughs> Luke will fix it. But if you want even more evidence uh, that welfare is truly dead in the minds of the $2 a day poor, uh, all you have to do is go back to the SIP. Uh, so we followed children over the course of a year, and we looked at whether those children had any adult who was claiming even a penny from TANF or any adult who was engaged in the formal labor market. And what we saw here was truly stunning. Right? Only one in ten of these households was claiming even a penny from TANF over the course of a calendar year, while 70% had an adult in the labor market. Okay, so this, this was really important. This, this told us something. This told us this was not a story of, of a group of people who were sort of fundamentally separated you know, from the mainstream, who were, who were you know, sort of set apart. Uh, but these were families, for the most part, who were really trying uh, to hang on uh, to the ragged end of a low-wage labor market that had become badly degraded. Uh, and as we began, of course, delving into the evidence on this, we learned that the bad jobs of yesterday, the, even the bad jobs uh, in the days of welfare reform were, be were far better than the, the truly bad jobs of today. So these, the families who we talked to really envision themselves as workers, as Kathy says, and uh, want to work. It's a, it's a core, uh, you know, with many, like Ray McCormick, uh, there was a, a very serious sort of opposition uh, to uh, applying for TANF. But it was really a combination of the unstable jobs that were there, uh, available to them. We saw many examples of unsafe work conditions, not getting enough hours as a core dilemma of, uh, of the $2 a day poor, as well as work fluctuations, uh, the number of hours going from, say, 10 in one week to 20 in another week, or 30 down to 20. Uh, and, and lots of examples of clear labor law violations, sometimes called wage theft in the case where uh, somebody might have actually gotten overtime, not being paid for overtime, or people being asked to uh, clean a hotel room as a hotel maid before they clock in, or clean up the store after they had clock, clocked out. So you had a lot of instability in, in the jobs, and you can think of you know, most of our folks as, as those at the very bottom only having access to the, the jobs uh, that, uh, that maybe nobody else wanted. But they might be able to survive that if they had uh, a, stable, uh, a stable personal life that could sort of make up for some of this. But in the case of our families, we would often see sort of the, uh, the interaction of unstable work opportunity combined with unstable family life. So you'd see volatile living arrangements, right? Uh, uh, a large degree of overlap with the number of, of children who are doubled up uh, not having a permanent place, not knowing are they going to be able to stay, and often actually subject to a fair amount of, uh, of, of risk in these circumstances. 
Uh, and in the case of these families, and I want to be clear, we don't think this is a story about the poor in general, but mm -hmm. among those at the very bottom, they often sort of seem to be situated in a social network of family and friends that are at best unsupportive and at worst uh, downright harmful. So to give you two examples, Jennifer Hernandez, when we met uh, Jennifer, she was uh, uh, living at, uh, had been living for 10 months in a succession of homeless shelters in Chicago with her with her kiddos, Caitlin and Cole, uh, nine and seven years old. Um, and uh, she was actually just about to be asked to leave the homeless shelter that she was in, because in most of these places, if you don't find a job, you're actually asked to move on. And Jennifer was incredibly um, uh, good at finding the resources that a, a relatively affluent city like Chicago has to offer struggling families. Uh, but she had no idea where the next place they were going to stay was, and she couldn't stay with family for some of these reasons I just mentioned. There had been an extremely abusive situation in the recent past. But she was able to find a job at Chicago City Custodial Services, uh, a small family uh, cleaning company on the south side. And when she started the job, she really liked it. She loved the, actually the ability to go in and clean a room and have made a visible difference in that day. I think a lot of what uh, many of us like about our jobs. Um, and it was going well, and she appreciated the structure. She would say, my mental health challenges were most at bay uh, uh, when I'm working, and I have the structure. But it, when she started, the work was really uh, uh, a lot of corporate apartments, right, between leases, uh, maybe uh, consultants coming in and out, or office spaces in the loop. But as the Chicago winter set in, she found herself going more and more to foreclosed homes on the south side of uh, of the city, and the west side of the city especially. Uh, and there's a large industry around getting all of these foreclosed abandoned homes back and ready for resale. Uh, and she was at the very bottom, I think, of this industry. So you can imagine going into these homes, there's been uh, no lights, there's no heat, and particularly there's no water. So they would come in and they'd never know what to expect, as she said. You know, sometimes we wonder, is there going to be a drug den when we get inside? Is there going to be a family that's uh, uh, that's squatting there. Is everything going to be have been ripped out of the you know anything of value have been ripped out of the unit by scrappers who come in uh, and and you know even rip open the the walls and take some of the piping, the toilets, the tile off the walls. Um, and th she would find that they were cleaning uh, in coats. Obviously, she'd go down to the Salvation Army and sort of grab another coat uh, to wear. Um, but maybe the thing that did it uh, for her was the water. So everyone who cleans knows uh, water is an important piece of the puzzle. And so there was no water at these places. They'd have to bring their own buckets in. And so they would come in. But you might imagine these places, as she says, were, were really dirty. A lot of cleaning had to be done. So after a half an hour, 45 minutes, maybe, um, the water would get pitch black of no use at all. And they'd have to dump out the water and go up to the nearest neighbor uh, who might have an outdoor faucet or go up to the nearest gas station and go, you know, avert eye contact and go into the, into the bathroom to refill the heavy jugs and then actually carry them back uh, to the cleaning site and maybe repeat this a couple times. So Jennifer was an asthmatic uh, and she had little kids and so she started to get sick. She had a few asthma attacks, but she found she was really susceptible to viruses, you know, cleaning in the cold. And everyone, I have small kids, uh, six and two, everyone knows when, when you get sick, uh, your children get sick. So she starts to uh, call in um, more and more. And her boss starts to see her as, a, as not a reliable employee. So then her hours start to tick downward. And she makes this decision where she says, you know what, I'm, I'm barely getting 10 or 15 hours a week now. And I have to call off some of those sometimes. I need to quit this job because she had gotten a housing subsidy that kept them stable. She was going to have that for a couple more months through the family homeless shelter. I need to quit this job and get healthy and start looking for the next one because how long is it going to take me to find the next job? So despite conditions like that, though, there remained this sort of real uh, attachment to work and the desire to work. So, um, think of Ray McCormick in Cleveland, who I think Kathy maybe mentioned. Uh, Ray was about 23, 24 uh, when we met her. She'd been abandoned uh, when, by her mother when her father died at 11. Uh, and one thing that uh, 
you, you would probably not notice about Ray right away is that she actually has lost all of her teeth because uh, she had some sort of dental disease um, and, uh, and, and had never gotten dental care. And so all of her teeth were gone. But she was incredibly skilled at sort of covering that up. So whenever she laughed, the hand went right over the mouth. Um, she worked at Walmart. Uh, her last stint in employment was at Walmart um, as a cashier. And she wanted to be the fastest cashier in the, uh, in the store. So she had this technique where she would actually, she knew to be the fastest cashier, you had to, um, uh, you had to be able to key in the produce items really fast. So she would take the most popular produce items and she would um, read the barcodes into a recording device on her phone. And then she would actually set that recording of herself to play overnight. And she'd say, in the morning, my subconscious had done the work. And she was named cashier of the month two times in the six months that she worked there. But in that six months, uh, she had been living with a, an aunt and uncle who were not related. Uh, and she actually got into the truck that they shared. And she'd given $50 into the pool to get gas. And she gets in the truck to go to Walmart. And the gas light is on. There's no gas. The car won't start up. She goes in and says, what's the deal? You know, this is supposed to be for me to, to be able to get to work. And they say, well, you know, we were running errands, uh, and we used up all the gas. Sorry. Ray has no way to get to work. And she calls her manager. She works in the suburbs, partially because she liked the ability to, to go to the suburbs, and I think, and get away uh, from the city. She worked in the suburbs. There was no way to get there by public transportation. And she called her manager and said, I can't get to work. You know, can you float me alone? I don't have any more money till sort of the next paycheck. And her, her manager said, if you can't get in, don't bother coming in again. So we see the interaction of, uh, of both volatile work conditions with an unsupportive uh, family. So if you think about our argument as a three-legged stool, uh, the first piece is really the welfare is dead. Uh, claim. Uh, the second piece really is that uh, uh, work has become, welfare is dead, but work has become degraded, uh, degraded to the degree uh, that it's inc incredibly hard uh, to uh, raise a family. And in fact, uh, it is, the, it is the, um, uh, the degradation of those jobs and uh, job loss, which, it, which, almost, which usually predates uh, entry into two-dollar day poverty. But the third uh, leg of this stool is housing instability. Uh, housing instability was ubiquitous among the poor. Uh, housing uh, has, uh, rental housing has increased in cost by about 6% since 2000, but renters' incomes have declined by 13%, so we see this increasing disconnection uh, between rents and wages. Of course, these folks have incomes so unstable uh, that they're often unable to stay in a place of their own. They end up in a series of perilous double ups or homeless shelters. And this is often when we see kids exposed to the greatest risk. Uh, but housing instability also interferes with work and often uh, both deepens and elongates a spell of extreme poverty, as do uh, the family relationships of many of our folks. Uh, and it is in these perilous double ups that we often see uh, the uh, the true harm, the trauma, uh, especially that children experience while their parents are living on less than $2 a day in poverty. Jennifer Hernandez at one point uh, flees uh, to an uncle's house to escape a bout of $2 a day poverty. Uh, she re uh, he's a respectable groundskeeper at a country club. Uh, she comes home one day, of course, and finds uh, him molesting her daughter, Caitlin. Uh, the family flees to a goodwill who generously uh, clears an office for the family to live in for a while since uh, there are no family beds in the shelter. And when uh, recounting the story, she said, I never expected that. Uh, Ray McCormick uh, similarly has lived among the $2 a day poor on and off since she was 12. And, and asked about the trauma she experienced as a child, she says, uh, matter of factly to us, I've been beat, I've been raped. Uh, and her daughter, uh, at age six, has also been molested. So when we start to look at the question that Kathy opposed at, this, um, at the beginning of, is, is cash important? So we have some resources and non-cash, SNAP, uh, some of these charitable organizations play a vital, vital role. But does cash matter? Really, I think the most compelling evidence of that 
is the work, the extent to which people spend their time trying to generate just enough cash to go on to the next day. So Travis and Jessica Compton, when uh, Travis's work hours got uh, cut down uh, after the holiday surge at a fast food restaurant, um, the only cash coming into the household was Jessica's uh, donation, I, I've been told to call it the, the selling of her blood plasma. So uh, every uh, two times uh, a week, and in fact, we're the only country that allows uh, plasma uh, donation uh, more than once a week. Uh, but two times a week, as much as the law will allow, uh, the whole family, Travis and Jessica and Rachel and Blythe, uh, their two little girls, uh, four and two, I think, uh, would actually walk uh, down to the, the plasma clinic. And Jessica's only about five foot two, and in fact, she would always have this panic as they're going uh, to, to the center that she's not going to meet the health requirements for the day. Her iron count is not going to be high enough, and, uh, or her blood pressure is not going to sort of be in the range that it has to be, and she's not going to be allowed to sell her plasma. Uh, because the $30 that that provides actually is perhaps the sort of the best hourly rates that they could get for, for anything. So she has all of these very sort of um, sort of planned out techniques that she, she always eats a, an iron rich supplement bar right as she's going in the door so that that's gonna boost her iron count and she does these uh, breathing exercises mm -hmm. um, as she's awaiting to get her blood pressure taken. So um, she, uh, she can make sure she's in the range. She brings a Nicholas Sparks uh, novel that she uh, uh, checks out from the library to try to calm her. And across the, the range of folks, you see all of this sort of very uh, serious strategies and, and I think uh, almost an American spirit in a way, right? We, we originally titled this chapter The Entrepreneurial Spirit because it was all about sort of figuring out what resources you have, whether it's your blood, whether it's your body, um, to sort of make, get that little bit of cash that'll keep you going uh, to the very next day. So you have to go back to the last slide real quickly. So uh, plasma sales were so ubiquitous, right, that uh, many people had a little divot uh, in their arms from selling plasma. It was almost like a, a, a marker of $2 a day poverty, uh, but a very debilitating thing if you do it very often. And many people actually uh, weren't healthy enough or, or strong enough to be able to give plasma that often. Uh, trading SNAP is probably not common among uh, the just plain poor, uh, we have a lot of evidence that, that it's actually quite rare. Uh, but among the $2 a day poor, it is actually ubiquitous. And uh, generally, uh, for, your, for your trade, you get 60 or even 50 cents on the dollar. Uh, so it, it, and since food stamps actually uh, don't uh, generally cover, we know this from surveys, uh, families' food needs for an entire month, this guarantees uh, that you and your children will go hungry. But when it comes to buying socks and underwear for school, uh, paying for the utilities, uh, or uh, you know, staying, uh, keeping the rent going for just one more month, uh, families do make that trade-off. Uh, finally, we see uh, just a lot of creativity. Uh, we, we occasionally see selling sex. Uh, we do see scrapping. Uh, but all of these are very, very low-level uh, survival strategies uh, that generate only a few dollars of cash, uh, typically and uh, really leave families uh, both consumed with the work of survival, but also very uh, badly off. Of course, the ultimate expression of this was in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, the two towns that we were in, Percy and uh, Jefferson, which are disguised, by the way, to, to protect the identity of our respondents, um, are in some sense an exception because they are so poor, you know, the poorest places on earth. Uh, but if you look at the Census Bureau's data, uh, you can see that there are little hidden rural places like this all across the country that share many of the characteristics of these towns. And it is here in the Delta that we really saw the intensification, uh, a system of mutual exploitation that kind of sprung up uh, because there was so much poverty. You could almost throw a stone in any given direction and, and you would be likely to hit the, the household of a family who was $2 a day poor. TANF pays so little in Mississippi that you actually, in most cases, will qualify as $2 a day poor, even if you happen to get it. Uh, so here, what we saw is that the not quite poor, who didn't really have enough cash to survive, this is especially uh, disabled people, 
would often be the purchasers of the food stamps of the extremely poor, right? Uh, often transporting uh, the extremely poor to the grocery store and then of course uh, basically uh, taking their price uh, by loading up uh, that, the extreme poor uh, family's cart with their own groceries. Uh, we also saw uh, what passed for the middle class in these towns, sometimes exploiting uh, the poor uh, because of their desperate circumstances. Uh, Tabitha Hicks in, uh, in the little town of Percy uh, was inboxed by a teacher when she's 15 years old. Her mother, Alva, had, had uh, uh, roughly a dozen children. Uh, this was probably uh, the poorest family that we encountered. They typically sold their food stamps when they came in uh, because uh, uh, they needed to pay the utilities and uh, the temperature just in the last six months had ranged from nine degrees to 109 degrees. So the family was always hungry as a result. And in fact, even when we met her, uh, Tabitha was almost uh, unbelievably thin for the, uh, after those years of hunger. Um, so a, fa a teacher, a gym teacher Facebooked her when she was 15 years old and wrote to her as follows, uh, I've been watching you, waiting for you to mature. Uh, then he suggested he, she come over to his house after school and promised food. And this led to, of course, a, a four-month liaison between the teacher and Tabitha where she exchanged sex in return for food. Now, uh, as we were talking with Tabitha about this story, um, I asked her, you know, what did it feel like uh, to be that hungry? And she answered as follows. Well, actually, it feels like you want to be dead because it's peaceful being dead. So what do you do with that? Um, you know, we, uh, as we sort of set out to write the last chapter, trying to think what are the, the policy implications as, uh, as folks uh, situated in schools of public policy and social work. Um, and, uh, and I don't think we have, clearly don't have all, all the answers. We think that, that we need to do something. Um, but I think there's a couple of hopeful notes here. We, we have heard, uh, we do understand that our book is depressing. So sorry about that. <laughs> um, but really, the folks who, uh, you know, Jennifer and even Tabitha, uh, they haven't given up. And, and, and they still have hope. And, and I think, uh, uh, so I think we can't either necessarily. So, so we don't provide all the answers for sort of moving forward and sort of trying to tackle the type of extreme poverty. Uh, but we did sort of, I think, get a, a couple of insights that at least wasn't on my radar uh, when we went in. The first was the importance of dignity and the extent to which uh, families would actually trade in uh, hunger, in a sense, trade in some resources uh, like SNAP uh, for the chance to, especially with their children, sort of get them some clothes at the thrift store that would give them a little bit of dignity when they go to school or get them, get them underwear. Um, and, and I think this, this very strong connection to work uh, really has a lot to do with a desire to be a part of, uh, of, a, of a community, right? Be a part uh, of America. So we have this premise, and maybe it's a simple premise, that whatever we do, whatever policy sort of solutions uh, we might try, maybe there's a litmus test. And, and maybe, it's, maybe it's simple, but maybe it's something more than that. That uh, whatever we do, either through government policy or uh, as universities or as nonprofits, um, we should see if these, uh, uh, these interventions or these programs work to incorporate poor families, as, as a, and especially those at the very bottom, into society rather than isolating them from it. And the history of welfare in this country is one of isolating families. So we talk about how what we see is partially, significantly, I would say, related to the welfare reform of 1996. But in no way do Kathy and I want to go back to the system we had before, which absolutely failed this test of, uh, of a litmus test of, of incorporating the poor. So uh, we uh, endorse three principles, and I think we do have a little, we, we have quite a lot of detail about how we think we might uh, move forward in the book. Uh, but the first principle is really about work, because work equals citizenship, 
in this society. The poor know it and they want it. Uh, there's no doubt that we have too few jobs to go around, especially too few good jobs at the bottom of the labor market. Uh, it's a serious problem. And if we're going to have a work-based safety net, and that's essentially what happened in 1996, we moved toward a work-based safety net, then we must ensure the opportunity to work. Second, parents should be able to raise children in a house of their own. This follows from the trauma that we often see, saw children exposed to. Uh, but third, uh, we do have to have a safety net that catches people uh, when they fall because sometimes work won't work. I'll end there and turn it over to uh, Professor Danzinger at all. <laughs> Okay, so um, a ton of questions have come in, a ton. We really appreciate it. And um, Rashid and Melanie are going to give you questions back and forth. They're sort of split between a little other ideas about causes and further explanations and ideas about policy, questions about policies. So we'll maybe go kind of back and forth. Um, uh, first off, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, my name is Melanie. I'm a first year master's student at the public policy school here. Uh, our first question, how might extreme poverty be growing because of mass incarceration, especially the removal of many men from their communities? Are you watching? Do you have ideas? Well, you know, it's interesting. We were really looking at households with children, and certainly households are made more vulnerable uh, when, uh, when the, the father is taken out of the household and, and separated from his children. Uh, we saw that in, uh, I believe, uh, Jennifer Hernandez's uh, children's, one of her children's father was incarcerated. Uh, this no doubt plays a role, and I've written about it extensively in my other books, especially uh, in the relationship between male incarceration and, and uh, family instability. Uh, so, so it is important. It's not something that we focus on here because uh, these families are often, uh, you know, it, what's interesting about $2 a day poverty, it's, it's sort of an equal opportunity uh, condition, right? We see uh, white families as well as black and Latino families on the rolls, and in fact, I think half the, the families in the SIP are, the households, are, are yeah. the households are white. Uh, we see married and unmarried households. Uh, we see households across the country. Uh, so I, maybe this is a special kind of poverty. Certainly, incarceration interacts with it, but there are, there are a number of groups uh, represented in this category that, that you don't sort of think about when you think about a poverty this deep. And those aren't necessarily the groups most affected by mass incarceration. Hello, and I am Rashid Malik. I'm a second year Master's of Public Policy student here at the Ford School, interested in social welfare policy and a former student of Luke Schaefer's. I will uh, have a two-part question. What administrative burdens are imposed on those living on less than $2 a day when they seek government assistance and how can we, and as policymakers, design programs that alleviate that burden and improve access and use of these programs? Good. So uh, this, is, uh, this gets us into the question of why TANF is sort of failing, uh, even I think in, in its stated mission, temporary assistance for needy families. And I at least thought when we started uh, this uh, investigation that it was really about work requirements, which were part of the sort of the welfare reform and it was about uh, time limits, right? Lifetime limits, that would make a lot of sense. And, and those play roles, but uh, really I think the bigger factor uh, is the structure, the very structure of the block grant itself. So the way that TANF is set up is to say, uh, states, here's a, here's a fixed pot of money, right, that we're gonna distribute across the states. And, and by the way, we're not gonna sort of in, in, you know, adjust it for inflation at all. So it's, it's declining in real value every year since 1996. Here's a fixed pot of money, and, and you can use it for cash assistance, right? You can use it for the stigmatized program that not many people like, and if you do that, we're gonna impose a lot of sort of restrictions on you that you have to have a certain fraction of the caseload working, and, and you have to take care of this and, and that. Or, if you don't give it out through cash assistance, which you don't have to do, you can pretty much use it for any other related thing, 
right? So you see a very, very clear incentive, and here at the Ford School, we know how important incentives are, uh, for states to keep their cash assistance caseloads artificially low. And we saw that in clearest force, I think, during the Great Recession, where the caseloads very much didn't sort of in any way sort of leap up like some of these other, um, like SNAP, for example. Um, and in a case of a lot of states, they've actually kept their caseloads incredibly low. So you might not just have 23 out of every 100 poor families on the, on the program, but I think we have some states that are down to eight or nine uh, uh, poor families out of every 100 on the program. And in those cases, a lot of those states are actually redistributing that money to other things that they would have spent on anyways. So there's actually no net positive benefit of the money going in through TANF rather than to provide a little bit of cushion for states. So I guess to answer the question, I would say um, building effective policy, uh, this is a great case example of what not to do, right? Um, and paying attention to the incentives that are sort of uh, uh, coming from the way that the program is designed. Uh, I think we have uh, a lot of nice examples uh, like SNAP, uh, which went to electronic EBT card. Uh, well, all, you know, a TANF is too, but that actually reduces, especially when we have high rates of residential instability, uh, reduces people losing their benefits. Uh, and you have a lot of states that are doing online and sort of longer recertification periods, and those sort of all make a difference. So to add to that, uh, the qualitative story here really is that uh, welfare has disappeared from the imaginations of the poor. It has become so rare uh, that the social networks, which might have spread the word, have really atrophied. But I, I do want to emphasize uh, this point about pride. Uh, almost to a person, actually to a person, uh, the people in our study, we followed 18 of these families very in depth over several years, really saw themselves as workers. And perhaps that's partly a, a credit to welfare reform. You know, back, in, back when Laura and I were studying, uh, Dean Lane and I were studying welfare receptions in the early 1990s, mothers would say, I don't know if I can be a good mother and a worker. Uh, now they say, I don't know how I can be a good mother if I'm not a worker, because I have to model the value of education to my children. Uh, so for better or for worse, uh, a strong work identity uh, motivates a lot of job seeking, and that's what you see over and over again in this book, these, these heartbreaking uh, endless, seemingly endless searches for work. Uh, but it doesn't make people very eager to come to TANF's door because that is really the antithesis of what workers do to survive. Can you expand a bit on the role of mental health in the extreme poor? So we saw a, a significant degree, I think, of mental health challenges. And we could trace a lot of those in the stories of the families uh, to uh, what's called in the literature adverse childhood experiences, right? So this is the sort of experience of physical, sexual abuse, uh, emotional neglect. Uh, and, and we know very clearly that these sort of experiences and especially uh, cumulatively experiencing many of them uh, follows a person through their life, lifetime. And we can see very clear associations with physical health uh, and mental health. Um, and, uh, and so that was very clear. And, and when you look at the ACE literature, it's actually um, quite astounding the significant degree of just all Americans who experience, these, experience uh, um, ACEs. Uh, but we think it's very much concentrated among uh, this group at the bottom. So uh, you can sort of see a clear link there. Now, uh, for us, we were actually very um, interested in the effect of, of work as mental health intervention. Uh, and, and the idea that uh, Jennifer Hernandez really liked the stability of work, the structure of work, I think a lot of us in this room can probably relate to that, right? Of, uh, you know, if you, if you lost your job, what would you do and, and how would you feel? Um, and, and so we're very taken with the possible healing effects uh, of work, uh, structured well, right? Decent, decent work uh, with, uh, with dignity. Um, and the last thing I'll say on this is that we did have, you know, there's, there's pretty good coverage, especially for kids, of, um, of a medical uh, insurance through our, our public health insurance programs. One of the, the good things we did during the 1990s was expand access to public health insurance for kids. And you can see a dramatic decline in the number of uninsured kids. And that the earned income tax credit, which provided a wage subsidy, and is the, uh, the story in Kathy's other one of her other recent books. It's a little intimidating to write a book with somebody who writes one before and after yours, but that's, that's for me to deal with. It's, it's not like I'm poor, it's about the ITC. It's also actually like the happy 
story of the 1990s, right, of providing you know, a significant wage subsidy for folks um, who go to work. So, so expanded health insurance uh, was a part of this, and we could see mental health treatment. Now, we didn't write about this in the book, but I will say we, we very much question the quality of the both physical and mental health treatment uh, that uh, many of our um, respondents got and wondered, are they actually, you know, this is an expensive program. We spend a lot on health insurance for the poor, and there's a, and it's still a question, open question in my mind, sort of what, especially for this, this group at the bottom, is the net benefit that they receive um, out of the treatment they get. And on to the next question from the policy pile. How might the policy idea of a universal child allowance help alleviate extreme poverty? So uh, people have, uh, you know, Lauren Summers and others have sort of noted that we may be running out of work, that automation might be affecting many jobs in the U.S. Uh, I know people have varied opinions on this. I think in one piece he suggests that we, uh, that we need some sort of guaranteed minimum income to get us out of this mess uh, of too little work. Uh, to us, uh, a guaranteed child allowance is a little different than a guaranteed minimum income because uh, parents feel worthy because they're claiming it on behalf of their children. And in fact, in the EHC book, people often coded it as the kids' money because they knew they were getting it in part because uh, they had children. So what I'm about to say probably applies more uh, to, um, to this notion that we should just uh, you know, basically subsidize a large group of Americans who aren't working. Uh, again, work equals citizenship in the United States. Uh, if, you ha if you've seen the Joe Run ad that was running last night during the presidential debates, uh, where he speaks very eloquently about uh, the dignity of work, and, and work is, you know, a good job is the ability to sort of say to your child with confidence, it's going to be okay, honey, you know, kind of re thinking about the story of his own father who had to uh, leave town to find a job uh, and then bring the family uh, uh, along later. Uh, but in any case, uh, we think in America that it's really important to find a solution for work because we're not just uh, interested in the fin uh, financial well-being of the $2 a day poor, uh, we're interested in an America where everybody uh, gets to take part, where everybody is sort of a part of the same community. Uh, what AFDC did uh, was to divide the poor. It was almost as if you had to trade your citizenship uh, card in uh, to cross the road that separates the worthy from the destitute. That's a rough uh, rephrase of T.H. Marshall's world uh, in order to get that help. And we think uh, that this is the 21st century and we should have a 21st century approach uh, to caring for the poor uh, that allows them to claim dignity and, and be part of society. And the work of several political scientists at least suggests that there might be spillover benefits uh, beyond fa financial well-being that extend uh, to citizenship participation. Uh, maybe we'll no longer be so prone to bowl alone and maybe even uh, voting and other activities that benefit our democracy. You described how family and friends could often have detrimental impact on these families, from abuse to maltreatment to theft. Did you find any trends that challenged this, such as family networks in smaller towns in the South or communities with more active churches and social clubs? So I think we had examples where family was a support. So that's what you're asking. And uh, uh, we take Susan Brown, who we write about in the first chapter, is, uh, is living with her, her husband, Devin, and their daughter, Lauren, um, baby daughter, Lauren, uh, with a number of other family members who are both sort of among the $2 a day poor, but they're able to live in a house that's sort of owned by the family. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's clear, actually, you can see uh, Susan, as we followed up with her sort of after the book, she's doing the best, I think, of, mm -hmm. of virtually all of our respondents, right? And so that family, Buffer is an important one. So I think what we were trying to note in the book was that, um, that family is not always positive. In fact, it can be, it can be a serious detriment. And, and again, we're not trying to say this is a story about the poor um, or, uh, you know, in general, but I think among this specific group, there's almost like a selection effect of, you know, if you're, if you're in these circumstances, 
you're, but you have family that can support you, you, you either get out very quickly or you don't, never sort of fall into our, the sample we selected. Next question. How optimistic are you for a genuine policy response to the new data you've discussed? Well, uh, I think we're both pretty optimistic people. So maybe that's, that's uh, what I'm going to reflect here. Uh, but, you know, I do think that we are in a moment. I mean, the reception of this book, uh, both at the state and federal level, has, has been absolutely astonishing. Uh, people seem very hungry for the information. They seem moved. Uh, but this is, this is one voice among many sort of pointing out uh, the degradation of work and, and, uh, and uh, uh, the, the deepening need of families, not just at the very bottom of the labor market, but maybe even, what, the bottom 40% of the labor market. Uh, that's in, it, it, experiencing many of the things that our $2 a day are exper poor experiencing, uh, but to a less severe degree. Uh, if you were watching the debates last night, you might have seen uh, the anti-Walmart ad, another total heartbreaker. It, is if, it was as if those families could be our families. So uh, people are catching on. There are, there are, you know, there's pressure for increasing the minimum wage. Uh, some folks are even thinking about expanding the reach of the EITC. So if not now, when? I actually applied for a job at, at Walmart uh, as part of this book. And Kathy was my <laughs> reference. Uh, and I, I didn't get a call. But uh, uh, um, yeah, I think uh, you know, I'm sort of, we're both sort of um, uh, pessimistic and incredibly optimistic at the same time. And, and you think in, in Washington, it's very hard to sort of do anything. Maybe we'll see sort of more stuff uh, at the state level. And I do think you can't expect sort of any one book to sort of really move the dial. It has to come with uh, other things. But uh, maybe we'll be a part of it. You also just never know sort of when the policy windows are going to open up. So what doesn't seem uh, possible you know, for David Elwood writing poor support in, in the late 1980s becomes very possible, like in the first month that he goes mm -hmm. into the Clinton administration where they expanded their earned income tax credit, which is, by the way, billions and billions more than we ever spent on, on, uh, on AFDC. It's just only, you can only get it if you work, so it's not really a safety net, right? So, uh, um, uh, so maybe it'll happen, something good will happen this year, maybe it'll happen five years from now. I will say that, uh, as we've been in Washington, I think the notion of doing something to create more jobs and government intervention, whether it's through public private ship, public private partnership, uh, is more on the table than it, it was, I think, five years ago. Thank you. Uh, next question. Reading your book, I was surprised that more of the extreme poor didn't turn to drug trade, though you mentioned other felonies. Do you think this is about character and their commitment to parenthood, or is there an economic calculation behind this as well? Not available or worth it? OK, great question. Uh, so uh, you know, one of the things that gives me great comfort is I've been in this business a long time. I've talked to thousands of poor families across 11, uh, well, let, let me see now, uh, roughly you know, 15 different locales across the United States. Um, so. We restricted our sample to parents with custodial children, right? Parents with custodial children very rarely sell drugs. And why? It's because uh, they're almost certain to lose custody of their kids uh, to the state, and uh, their kids are their most precious asset, so they don't uh, want to do that. Now, uh, are there drugs in the Mississippi Delta? Are there drugs in Chicago, Cleveland, uh, Johnson City? Absolutely. Uh, but it's generally not parents who are engaging in those kinds of behaviors. So uh, it is interesting how uh, you know we can we tend to think of uh, drug dealing as sort of this ubiquitous activity, and you do hear a lot about it in all the locales that we talk to. But these these are parents desperately trying to keep their families together. You know, if they weren't tough, they are, we would have already lost their children to child protection. Their very uh, living circumstances often put them at risk of CPS involvement. Paul Heckwilder had the 22 people in his house. Uh, he was very nervous uh, to engage with social services because, of course, uh, that would have violated uh, the rules many times over of, of how many children could be in the same room and what their ages and genders could be. Uh, so uh, I'll end there. But it, it's a question that comes up every time. And it's actually quite interesting to see how little we see of this, especially <laughs> since 
Uh, all, all of our families except one actually did have to commit at least one felony in order uh, to survive during the period that we observed them. Our next audience questioner asks, besides the welfare reform, have you seen major changes on the low wage on, in the low wage labor market side that leads to more instability? We think that there was a, a fairly significant change or a start of a trend in the low wage labor market starting in the early 2000s. Uh, and, uh, and, and we've actually, I think, uh, a lot of us has, have thought it was there and we're starting to get more data that I think confirms uh, that. And, and a lot of that has to do uh, with the, um, the prevalence of these sort of um, unstable sort of work conditions outside of wages. So low wages is a part of the story, right? But uh, these, uh, you know, keeping large part-time workforces, uh, keeping, uh, you know, uh, this sort of very closely um, linking consumer demand to, uh, uh, to um, the number of people you have in the store, right? On like an hour to hour basis. Some of these things employers just couldn't do you know, 20 years ago. So, so we think all of these things are clear. The, the, uh, actually, we see a lot of examples of on-call work also, where somebody uh, doesn't get paid, but is actually required for sort of a set of hours to be by their phone and able to come in. Or in some cases, they actually have to call in every couple hours just to see if they're wanted, and they don't get paid for that. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of talk about, um, you know, what kind of policy reforms do you undertake uh, to sort of fix those kind of problems. And, and I tend to think often that employers are smarter than policymakers. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you did something to say, well, you can't keep people on call, um, employers might figure out a way to get around that or they might come up with something else that sort of helps them. So that's why we have such a focus, I think. I think we, we absolutely need to look at policies that can kind of curb some of these. One thing we can do is try to curb the extent of labor law violations that exist, right? So as it is right now, uh, it's, it's, it's better for an employer to sort of not pay overtime if people actually get overtime or to sort of engage in some of these practices uh, and risk being caught, because chances are they won't be caught. And if they get caught, the penalty isn't that bad, right? So actually benefiting from those is better. So maybe we just start by enforcing what we have on the books. Um, but uh, in addition, I think, this notion of creating more jobs, right? And these public-private partnerships of, of potentially subsidized jobs or, or jobs coming through the nonprofit sector will put pressure on the labor market and should positively <laughs> impact some of these practices. Having said that, uh, the problem is really big. And uh, I think many of the programs we can point to right now are pretty small. So uh, we also say in the book that we might actually have to uh, reconceptualize how we think of work and how we think of the government as an employer. Uh, and maybe this is too big of a thought for a policy school, I hope not, but uh, there is so much work to be done in our communities. Uh, there are parks that aren't cleaned or are not open uh, because we can't afford the personnel uh, to, to, to keep them open. We have recreation centers uh, that have limited hours, public libraries uh, that are barely open on uh, the mm -hmm. little town of, uh, of Percy. Uh, there is a public library that has virtually no books, and it is only open limited hours because they can't afford a librarian. Uh, our, our, our cities are filthy. Um, our uh, preschools are too few. Our classrooms are too large. There is so much work to be done in our society. And if you say to me, well, the government has never proved to be a very good employer, I would just like to point out our teachers and our firefighters and many fine public service uh, servants who are employees of the government and whose work is a vital uh, value to our daily lives. And this will be the last question we have time for today. Uh, we spoke a bit about potential policy responses, but what do you hope will come from the public reading your book? Well, so um, when Kathy and I started to write this book, we, we knew we wanted to try to do a popular press book, right, and try to actually connect with a, a broader audience. And we were happy to get a contract with Houghton Mifflin that has brought us such literary um, icons as um, uh, Ralph, uh, Ralph Waldo uh, Emerson and uh, Curious George. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, you know, I think the, we have sort of a, 
a targeting policymakers strategy and also uh, being, a, being a, a discussion point, right? And, and I hope maybe the book uh, goes a little bit along these lines of in so, social incorporation, that it allows, we tried to tell people stories. My mother was a professional storyteller, so uh, I've sort of known the importance of stories for a long time. Tried to tell the stories in an, a respectful but honest way, right? And try to sort of bring people to meet people that they wouldn't have ever met in their life because you know, we're so stratified uh, in society. So I think we would be really happy if uh, people picked up this book who didn't necessarily agree or had thought a lot about, uh, uh, about poverty in the United States and, and used it as a sort of a resource to, to hone what they, you know, sharpen their, their ideas about uh, what poverty is like and what we should do about it. Well, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank Sandy, Rashid, and Melanie for facilitating the questions and all of you for a fabulous group of questions. I know we didn't get to all of them. I hope you'll stay so that we can continue the conversation in the Great Hall and you can get your book signed. Um, please join me in a final round of thanks to Kathy Eden and Luke Schaefer. Thank you.